as you help us to project. So last week we started with um, the topic, the names and titles of the church. Um, the names and titles of the church. I just want us to share from um, what we could remember or what stood out for us last week. We started with looking at some of the names, but um, it's good to hear from us, those that were here, on uh, what we could remember from last week's um, session. The names and titles of the church. Who wants to fill us out? So while we are waiting for, it's good to you can go through your. Okay, Brafala wants to say something. In having different branches, plenty branches, and that uh, is a symbol for uh, the body of Christ that uh, we are all connected to the Lord Jesus. You know, looking at that picture, the the branch is the one we can see at uh, having different parts, but the the root we see it's going down, and they are all connected, meaning that. Uh, as we have different churches, different branches, different dominations, we are expected to be connected to one source, which is Jesus Christ. So each branch is on the tree. They have what they, they, they stand for. They provide shade, you know, looking at the function and what those branches are meant for. They provide support for the leaf. Uh, they facilitate the supply of hormone, source of nourishment to members, you know, a lot of things 
we can deduce from looking at the tree having different branches, you know, can serve as a shade. I remember somebody said that, that the branches serve as shade for people to rest under when there is hot sun out there. When people come under the shade of the tree, you'll be refreshed. Amen. Thank you very much, Rafaela. So that's them looking at the church as the branch of the Lord's planting. Like you mentioned, looking at, if you see the picture of the tree that was projected last week, it had branches. It could, um, which, uh, which is representing a church. A church should be a place where people can come to and they know that, okay, I'm under you know, a shade, I'm protected here. Yeah, Nobody is um, looking out for my downfall or something. You know, they see the church as a, as, a, as a source of strength. They are able to come and um, you know, gain from the church and also giving back to the church. And also, like you mentioned, that the, the branch you know, supplies water, supplies so many things to the main tree. And that's the same way a church is, where there might be different denominations all around the world, but each church has what is supplying to you know, the body of Christ as a whole. Amen. Amen. So we'll take more contributions. What can we remember from what we learned last week? You know, we started the conversation with um, Ephesians 3, 8 to 11, talking about the manifold, you know, the different sides of God. And we, know, and we now said, okay, that manifold in that, in that context means you know, diversity, mystery, different things. So we are looking at the different faces of the church as in what the church really stands for. And we also mentioned that the church is you and I. It's not this structure. So what we stand for and what as a community, as a body, when we come together as a church of Christ, what we stand for. So he mentioned the first one. He has explained the first one. We're looking at um, the, you know, the various metaphors and symbols that the nature and the purpose of the church represents. First is the branch of the Lord, um, Lord's planting, which he mentioned. We also talked about the city of the living God. That was where we stopped and we considered Hebrews 12, 22. If I could get these slides, I would appreciate that, please. I know. Thank you. So please, can you help with Hebrews 12, 22? That was where we stopped last week. So looking at the church as a city of the living God. Okay, I'll read from verse 18, looking at um, comparing Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. We looked at that last week from verse 18. Okay, from verse 18, it says, For you have not come, as the Israelites did, to a mountain that cannot be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to gloom and darkness and a raging windstorm and to the blast of the trumpet and sound of the words, those who heard it begged that nothing more to be said to them. Remember the Israelites then, the way, if I can read from you, from verse 18, please. It says, for you have not come to the mountain that cannot be touched, and that burned with fire, and to, darkness, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words, so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commandment, commanded. And if so, more, if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrified was the sight that Moses said, I am extremely afraid and trembling. 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to a, an innumerable comp, um, company of angels. So last week, um, we also looked at comparing Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. From verse 18 that we read, we saw how scared and how afraid Moses and the Israelites related with God in Mount Sinai. When they saw God, you know what they saw, the picture they had of God was a big God out there, scary always you know, looking out for them to, always ready to give consequences and all that, that Moses was very afraid, the Israelites were very afraid. You know, but looking away from that, going to verse 22, it says we have come to Mount Zion, we have come to a different place, a, you know, a city that is um, 
the city of the living God. And that was the second point we were considering last week where we stopped. Okay, if you have the slides now, please share so that people would have an idea and remember, we're trying to just take um, feedback on what we learned last week. We've gotten feedback on the branch of the living God and we mentioned also that you know, the church is also a representation of the city of the living God. We looked at, okay, what is a city? A city is a, you know, is a metropolitan place where people come to and businesses and all that happen there. But looking at that in the context of the church, it says we've come to that verse 12 says, Okay, verse 12 says, sorry, verse 22 says that, um, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the innumerable company of angels. So we'll be looking at each of these words and you know, relating it to the church. We've discussed about the city of the living God last week. So we can go to verse 23, please. Verse 23 says, okay, And to the general assembly and the assembly of the firstborns who were registered as citizens in heaven, and to God who is the judge of all, and to the spirit of the righteous, the redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect, bringing them to their final glory. Okay, sorry, I'm reading the Amplified. It says, To the general assembly, to the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judges of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect. So the next point here is we are looking at the church as um, the church of the firstborn. So when we say the church of the firstborn, what comes to us? You know, it's good to say contributions. When we say the church of the firstborn, what comes to us? Who is the firstborn? Who is the firstborn that we are referring to here? Who is the firstborn here? How many firstborns do we have here? Some of us, we are middleborns. Okay. <laughs> That it as a firstborn, what do you think um, firstborn stand to you know, represent? We have some lastborns here too. <laughs> Take care of the younger ones. They care for them and help with the house chores, you know, and all that. Like me, I started cooking. I make sure my younger ones, I beat them and all that. And we we'll go to school together. I take them to school. Yeah. So that's basically they are they bear burden. They carry the burden of the younger ones. Yeah. Okay, Uncle Francis. <laughs> I don't want to use wahala, but when you are firstborn, even if your parents are still alive, there's a time that all the whole thing will be on your head. They will pass the mantle or the or I don't know what you call it, but. First born child, they, they hear him. So they <laughs> <laughs> okay. So like you said, you know, the, resp the firstborns have a lot of responsibility. Like even when their parents you know, are alive, they still, you, at a point, you know, you just know that you are responsible for all your siblings, except you are the only child. In fact, they might, even if you are the only child, they will push you that you are responsible for all your cousins, cousins, distant cousins and all that. So firstborn, you know, have a, play a critical role in any family. And let's look at Romans 8, verse 29. It's recorded there that Jesus is that firstborn among many believers. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be Conform to the image of his son. Who is that son, Jesus Christ? That he might be the firstborn among many believers. So it's in the Bible, even in Hebrews 1 6, it's recorded that Jesus is that firstborn, you know, among all of us. So we are all emulators of, you know, we are all, like the scripture says that um, when he died, we died. When he rose, we also arose. And we are seated together with him in heaven, you know, in the heavenly places, in the heavenly realms. That is where we are, and that is where we should see ourselves. So Jesus Christ is that firstborn of, you know, among many believers. So we are like Christ, you know. That's why we are Christians. We are like Christ. So we are also that firstborn you know, among many believers. So, it's, you know, I'm relating that to the church, that the church 
No, he's the firstborn. I'm going back to Hebrews 12, 23, that the church of the, one of the name of the church is the church of the firstborn. So this means that we've come to a company of believers, as in believers that are God's chosen, because we are also chosen of God. The same way um, Jesus Christ was, God chose Jesus to die. God also has chosen us, you know, to, to not to die in this case now, but to stand and also raise others to be like him. So we are God's chosen. We are equally the sons of God. We are born of Christ. We are loved by Christ. And we have the same privileges. We have the same honors. We have the same dignity, the same way Christ has. has. So as a church of um, of the firstborn. This is say metamorphosis, the church of the firstborn. That means we have the same privileges, we have the same honor, we have the same, um, you know, all the things that, are, that comes as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is also accorded to us as a church. So we can say, yes, one of the names of the church is the church of the firstborn because of what Christ has come to do. And Christ is that firstborn among many believers. Amen. Am I the only one here? Amen. Amen. So we'll take um, contributions. What do we think when we say the church is the first, the church of the first one? Metamorphosis Christian Center, um, so, 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 Christian Center, whatever um, Christian Center, they are the church of the first one. What comes to mind, you know, in um, relation to all that we have heard, especially looking at Christ as the first one among many believers, amongst, you know, all of us. Yeah, I'll call names. I know your names. Okay. Then, okay, Pastor Shanti. Um, okay. Yeah, firstborn in the natural, within our own culture, we know it's um, responsibility. At the same time, it is authority. Now, the, the challenge is, in some families, the firstborns exercise authority without taking responsibility. That's where usually there's problems. But in the context of the scriptures, and especially in, within the context of Jewish history, that's where we need to look at to know what he was saying. Because he wrote all these things with the background that they have an understanding of what the firstborn represents in their culture. Now, in Jewish families, the firstborn, number one, you know, God gave them laws. He said, the firstborn is mine. The firstborn should be consecrated unto him. There are several scriptures. I think we've gone over some of them, you know. Um, that's one. They belong to the Lord. But instead of taking all the firstborns to be priests, that's why he took the family of Levi. But even then, there was need for redemption of firstborns, you know, because they shouldn't, ordinarily they shouldn't be priests. So that is one thing. Service is one thing that that carries. When you say firstborn within the Jewish family, it carries a, uh, should I say, understanding of dedicated life and service to God. So when it says we are the church of the firstborn, based on that understanding, then all of us are priests and servants of the Most High God. In fact, this is why... Some preachers still man in a way, not that they put pressure, but they teach their firstborn sons to follow in their footsteps. That's why you tend to see firstborn sons of, you know, established ministers taking up ministerial positions because it is from here. And for some of them, they are still holding strongly to that. So that's, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing there is authority. The firstborn has a right. Once the father says, this is, like you said with Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At certain ages in Jewish culture, certain things happen. At age 12, you hear of bar mitzvah, you know. Uh, at 20, you know, learning family trade responsibility. At 30, it's as if they come into full manhood or maturity. And at that point, the father can delegate him to take decisions on behalf of the family and on his behalf. It's as if he's already been groomed, in quotes, to take over. 
So, and it was, that's why for the Lord Jesus too, at his baptism, the Lord, the, the father was saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So there is that vested authority in the firstborn to take decisions. So when he says we are the church of the firstborn, that's why I said authority. Authority is conferred on us. Another thing you see with first, I hope I won't say all the points, but another thing you see with firstborns, there is always a double portion of inheritance. As in, if the father has stuff that he's sharing, let's say the quantity is given to everybody is 100. 100. When it comes to the firstborn, they give him 200. So there is double to show that this one oh, is, uh, Yorubas will say, Olori Ebi is the next in line. He is the chief amongst his brothers. Everybody needs to listen to him. So that is when he says we are firstborns, he also calls us joint heirs. You read through Romans, apart from our redemption, another thing you always see is that concept of joint heirship with Christ. Meaning that everything that the Father has given unto the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, you want to claim the whole portion of it, it is available. So those are some of the things that firstborn represent. So, and you have also access. Where there is conflict or anything, sometimes people need to go through the firstborn to reach the father. As in, you want to come to the father. It's also why the Lord will say, yes, this is my son. No one comes to the father except by me. Jesus was talking to them based on their understanding. If there's an issue with a family, it's only fathers, even if a father wants to see another father, sometimes they'll say, tell your father I'm coming to see him. They tell the firstborn that they want to come and see his father. So he's the one that says, sir, these people are coming, okay, and then he cannot arrange a meeting. So the firstborn, you know, access is the access to the father, actually. So, and in God saying, this is my beloved son, and in Jesus saying, no one comes to the father but by me, he's telling them, you know what it means to be firstborn in your own family. I am God's firstborn. You come to God through me. Now, that has also conferred responsibility, meaning we can also bring people to God. So we have direct access. Not that it's through you that people will be saved. You are not Jesus. It's only through Jesus Christ that we gain salvation. But when it comes to that matter of access of the firstborn, we all have direct access to God. So that's why you can pray and God can hear you. That's why you can pray for people and God can hear so those are some of the things. So you need to, like, the church did not just come out of the blues. God worked with the children of Israel. He established certain patterns. I mean, the topic before this one was pattern. So we need to look at those things. Those, some people call them types, shadows, patterns that were established. So that some of these phrases are more, they are deeper than we know. If we just look at our own culture alone, firstborn is only work that you see, responsibility, but there is more within what God established in Israel. So, church of the firstborn, that is who we are. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. So, I, I like the way you explained it because you kept mentioning we, we, we. And like I said from the beginning, we are the church. We are looking at the names of the church. Fine. We are looking at the church as a community, MCC, but also looking at our individual selves. So when we are explaining this thing, let's put that um, you know, in context and know that we are referring to ourselves and we are also referring to this community and other denominations that are referred to as a, a community or a church of Christ. Thank you, sir. So we look at the next name, which is Heavenly Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem. Okay. Oh, sorry. Dr. Adi. Pastor, Pastor Adi. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I just Sorry, sir, please, do we have the slides now? Thank you. I just want to say something from where Pastor Sheon stopped. That um, though the birthright of the firstborn by nature should be settled, but the firstborn himself must also learn some things and conduct him or herself in a particular way to actually enter into that inheritance. Example is Reuben. If we read um, Genesis um, 49, 3, um, 
Jacob acknowledged the fact that Reuben was his firstborn, the first seed he had, his first strength and everything. But uh, what followed was not a very good thing because he transferred those responsibilities and those benefits away from him. You discover that the leadership, the kingship authority Reuben was supposed to have was transferred to Judah. And that double portion was transferred to Joseph because of some things he did. If we move forward, we also discover that God in his own sovereignty can decide to change some things. Remember Esau and Jacob. It's not that they did anything wrong, but God did that. Remember Solomon and Adonijah and Absalom. Solomon was not supposed to be in the reckoning at all. But God just decided this is the person I will use. And uh, if we read Philippians, I think it's in one or two, Jesus had to go through some things to obtain that ability, that, 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 uh, that uh, to be qualified. Though he was firstborn, but he also has to pass it. He, he, he passed through a lot of, he has to learn obedience. You understand? He did some things before he was given that name which is above every other name. So, so Jesus paid the price for him to actually have that responsibility of the firstborn conferred on him. He was firstborn, there was no doubt. But he came, he did something, he showed us, went to the cross. So we also need to do that. So being a firstborn, why it's, from the Jewish perspective, it's like everything goes through you. Jesus also paid some price for him to have that responsibility conferred on him and for him to, and that's why the devil can do nothing about it because he did it and he did it well and he qualified to be the church of the, that's why the, the, the church can be attached to his name as the church of the firstborn. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Just, um, I, I just want to say this because it just came to mind now. Now, we see a lot of deliverance going on for firstborns around us. How many of us have seen that? You know, battle of firstborn. Because some preachers will use uh, Reuben. You know? Uh, but it was because he committed an offense. So the right of firstborn was taken from him. It was actually given eventually, initially to Joseph. And then later it came to Judah. Now, even Judah made the egros, But repentance is what restored Judah. Now, for Reuben, he didn't, we don't have a record of his repentance of that act. They will also use Esau. Esau came, with, even though they were twins. So both of them are actually firstborn. But they will say this one came first. And then they will say uh, Esau, you know, he missed it. His birthright was given to Jacob. They will also use, uh, who is the third? Cain and Abel. Huh? They say Cain too. Missed. You know, they will just pick some stories. Now, when he calls off the church of the firstborn, because God always, and then they will base it on the fact that God said the firstborn must always be redeemed, and they will now make a matter come for deliverance, deliverance of firstborn. When he calls us the church of the firstborn, Jesus has already redeemed us. So I'm just saying it because uh, it just, you know, so that we don't come, in some people who are firstborn so now go for deliverance. You've already been delivered though. In coming into Christ, all the benefits are already conferred. Yours is just to line up, believe by faith, and then you take possession of it. So there's no battle disturbing any firstborn here, except if you don't know. The battle you have is with ignorance, and then if you yourself are now breaking certain laws, laws of scripture that God has established, and certain common sense behavioral laws, if you are breaking them, then you have problem, but the battle of firstborn has already been won. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. It's already been won. So beware of flyers of uh, battle of firstborns that you want to attend. It's not for us. We've been redeemed already. Jesus Christ is the firstborn among us. So he has he paid that price for us already. Amen. Amen. Any other contributions before we go to the next one? Okay, if there is none, we'll go to the next name of the church. Please, the next slide, it says um, the church is also called the Heavenly Jerusalem. 
the heavenly Jerusalem. We'll go back to Hebrews 12, 22. We've gone through that scripture, and when we say heavenly Jerusalem, what comes to mind? What's the picture of heaven that we know or that we've heard of, and how can we relate it as the name of the church? If I say heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, heaven, pictures of heaven, what comes to mind? And how can we relate that? You know, we are looking at, in all that we say, we must relate it to us as an individual, as a church, and also the community called the church denominations. Nobody is talking. Please, let's go back to Hebrews 12, 22. Twenty-two, please. Yeah, it says, "But well, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable com company of angels." So, when we say the heavenly Jerusalem in this context, what can we say? You know, what what does it mean to us? Heavenly Jerusalem, we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We are saying Metamorphosis Christian Center. Is a heavenly, it should be a heavenly Jerusalem, it should be heavenly. So if I say, oh, this is a heavenly place, what comes to mind? Rafala, please. Okay, my own version says, uh, that verse 22, the last part says, uh, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. Joyful gathering. That uh, word tells me that uh, it's a place where we would experience joy. It's, a place, it's not a place where we mourn. When we say heavenly Jerusalem, you know that picture of heaven, like, uh, I mean, uh, I think when I was much younger, we used to say that when you go to heaven, it's, uh, it's all fun, it's all joy. Angels singing and prostrating, singing praises to God. You know, that kind of gathering where we are worshiping our Father. It's a place of joy. There's no morning, there's no evening. You know, everywhere is just, uh, just full of uh, light where there's joy. So, we now bringing it down to we Christians, we the children of God, that uh, when we come together in a meeting like this, we are to experience joy. We are to experience joy, yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Pastor Shio. It's a place of joy. Whatever um, community we find ourselves, as in community of Christ, the body of Christ, is a place where joy of the Lord must be expressed. Amen. Okay, um, this one I won't try to explain, but I will rephrase the question in a way. In another way, what do you know about the earthly Jerusalem? <clears throat> what does the earthly Jerusalem mean to the native Israelites? Then that will give us a picture of what the heavenly Jerusalem will mean to us. That's why, you know, why are they so intent on recovering Jerusalem as the capital today? It's one of the reasons. If you understand that they are willing to die, this Jerusalem, no matter what United Nations or anybody says, we are not sharing it. You know, you will have thought that over the years, uh, all the arguments for, is it human rights? And, you know, they say two-state solution. That's what some people have said. Let one part belong to Israel. Let one part belong to Palestine. Let both of them use the two as the capital. They say, no, because... Jerusalem signifies something. So, uh, if we can't answer it, maybe we'll go and research it. But because just beyond saying heavenly, Jerusalem as a city, what does it represent? What does it mean to them? Then we begin to get a picture of what we are as a church when we say we are the heavenly Jerusalem. That's why, okay, let me, you know, they will always go, it's a place of convergence, both earthly. Heavenly, I mean, they will always go there. 
Because they know that when they go to Jerusalem, they are actually meeting with God face to face. So it's a place of encounter. That is, that is, one, that is one thing. You know, God's presence is there. The reality of God is there. Even now, that's why they will not give it up. Because this place where our fathers met with God, we are not sharing with anybody. <laughs> Over their dead body, they are willing to die for it. So that's one of the things Jerusalem means. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We'll actually still get there because Jerusalem and Zion, you know, is used interchangeably in church. And one of the names of the church is Mount Zion. We'll get there and we'll talk more about, you know, speak really more about Jerusalem, Zion, and what it really represents. Thank you very much, sir. So like he said, if we understand the earthly significance of Jerusalem, we'll be able to really picture what the heavenly Jerusalem means. And like Brother Fola said, you know, joy is one significant thing in heaven. Worship. You know, MCC should be a place of worship. People should come here and they should know that they are encountering God, like Pastor Sheon said. You know, even our individual lives, we shouldn't just live a life that is only when we come to church that we are worshiping. Our daily life should be a life of worship. We should daily encounter God in every day of our life, Monday to Sunday, Monday to Saturday, before we come to church on Sunday. So, you know, looking at the picture of heavenly Jerusalem, we could note a lot of things. A lot. Of, just think of um, what what you think. What do you think you'll be experiencing when you get to heaven? You know, it's the same way that people should come to this church and experience. People should, should feel like they are they are close to heaven, <laughs> not. Not that they're dead in that sense, but they should know that, no, there's something different about this place. The encounter, you know, the presence of God, the, you know, the, the worship, the ministry, the prayers, everything about this place should be something that stands out, you know, from, and it should be the same across the body of Christ, you know, especially the, you know, communities that are preaching the doctrine, sound doctrine, and in line with the precepts of Christ. So, the church as a heavenly Jerusalem should, you know, you should, for me, just, I just picture, aside from the earthly Jerusalem, like Pastor Sheo said, you know, heavenly Jerusalem is a place of encounter, is a place where we are bounded in love. People come here and they should feel loved. They shouldn't feel like, oh, there are some clique of people, me, I'm just there. No, people should come here and they should see love, they should see unity, they should see, what do you think, you know, would be happening in heaven? There is no clique in heaven, there is no... Though God has built mansions for us, but we would all come out to, to, to there is no division out there. There is no, um, no what's that, racism, diversity, and all that. We will all be one because we are all, you know, thinking as one. And it's the same thing that the church represents. Amen. Pastor Rotten. Praise the Lord. Okay, just to add to what has been said. Um, when you talk about the heavenly Jerusalem, what differentiates the earthly Jerusalem from the heavenly Jerusalem is the word heavenly. And when you think of heavenly, Brofola has mentioned joy, you're smiling, you're laughing, you're having fun, you're worshipping and all of that. And um, part of what you also have in heaven, apart from the presence of God, is the presence of angels, right? Um, there is spiritual activity going on there. It's not, it, is not, um, it, is not an, it is not a place of the flesh. It is not a place of the natural man. It is not a place where uh, the reasoning and the wisdom of man is existent. No, everything is about the reasoning of the Father. It's the intent of the Father is the uh, counsel of the Father, the, the, the glory of the Father covers everywhere. And then when you look at what heavenly Jerusalem uh, would be, let me say would be, right? Looking at Revelations, when the Bible says that the new heaven and the new earth, right? And then heavenly uh, Jerusalem is going to be represented there again. Now, having, so when you picture, oh, the new heaven, the new earth, and all of that, what are we talking about? We are talking about the new earth being a representation of the new Jerusalem, sorry, the heavenly Jerusalem. And wherever we gather, whenever we gather, there is that uh, consciousness of the essentials of heaven in our midst. Angels are seated with us. They are present here in this place because that's what the Bible says. Whenever we gather, Father himself is here. The Holy Spirit is here. Jesus himself is here. 
and the experiences that we would um, uh, read about in the Bible, we, we believe that as the Spirit of God moves, we begin to experience some of those things or those things here. I mean, the spirit of just memory, I mean, it's like you saying, okay, Moses is here. I mean, Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah and Moses appeared to him. That is what we are talking about. Whereby, and we've heard of people who have had encounters with them, even with Elijah, with Isaiah, with Samuel, and co and co. And these are representations of how our experiences should be. Yes, uh, some of us might not have had it. Some of us might have. But we want to have it. We want to see uh, the manifestations of uh, what goes on in heaven when we gather. Praise the Lord. So that is our desire. That should be our drive. That should be our prayer. That when we come together, we want to see God in his full glory. We want to see him come over our meetings. We want to see him. I mean, when, when God comes over your meeting, when his glory comes down, I mean, the, the atmosphere changes. We sing about it. We talk about it. We read about it in the Bible. We read testimonies. I mean, we read the account of the dedication of the temple and all of that. This is what our desire should be. This is what our hunger and our drive should be, such that we don't just come and then we hear, we sing, we dance, and then we go home. Nothing has changed. Praise the Lord. Something should be added to us every time. When you come into the presence of the king, something is deposited in you. You take something back. You take something away. Apart from bringing something to the king, you take something away. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Dr. Adedu. Okay. Thank, thank you. I just want to read the place, but quickly before that. I want to also know that um, so we've come to the company, uh, to the heavenly Jerusalem. The, as a Christian, when we become born again, our life is like a continuum. That is faced. What do I mean? Once you, you should understand that the church does not only end as in this earthly church we're talking about. And uh, the experience of the heavenly Jerusalem, like Pastor Ruth, we are expected to have such experience consistently. And uh, for us to do that, Pastor Sean has spoken about earthly Jerusalem and heavenly Jerusalem. And what Heavenly Jerusalem will look like, or looks like, is actually well described in Revelations, Revelations 21. Just permit me quickly to just read it out. I, I will be as fast as possible, because it's very important. We know. Now, Revelations 21, um, there, it's a long place, but I will just start from 21. They discuss the, the quality of the buildings and uh, what is used to build them. But uh, it said, the 12 gates are pearls. Each individual gate was made with a single pearl. The broad streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a sanctuary in it because the Lord, the Almighty, Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need sun or moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its Lamb is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close, because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and the and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the book of the Lamb. So what we're saying is all these things are what the church because that's where we have come into. Those are some of the things that we should be experiencing here. It's like for this year, we, we are manifesting His glory. Yes, we still experience our sunlight, but in our life, do we, is it, we should not have darkness in terms of depression, in terms of those dark, dark things in our life, because the glory of the Lord is in us, and it's our moon, it's our sun, and whatever we do, we should be consistent in that, because that's what that's the company we've come into. We've come to heavenly Jerusalem that is consistently lightened, that is consistently um, joyful, like Prof. Fola said, that is consistently there. So it's a phase as we continue to walk in our life, a point time we come, either later in life, that we will, not, we will transition fully into that heavenly Jerusalem by His grace, because our name is written in the book of the Lamb. Thank you.
Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And this scripture really brings to light ex um, exactly what we are talking about. It's, like you mentioned, metamorphosis are seen this year as manifesting glory. So in our individual lives, that should be you know, what is driving us all through the year, that we are manifesting the glory of God. There is no darkness in any area of our lives. Amen. Amen. We'll just rush to take one more before we close. The next name is General Assembly. Um, for as many that still have our manuals, the next name the church is referred to is General Assembly. Let's read Hebrews 12, 23. Hebrews 12, 23. So but when we say General Assembly, what comes to mind? You know, we have the General Assembly of the United Nations. Countries have National Assemblies. Our politicians here, our social, social whatever here. Let's, well, what comes to mind when we say General Assembly? Okay, this version says, okay, yeah, we've come to the General Assembly and the Church of God. So we explain the Church of the First Born, but we've come to General Assembly. So what comes to mind when we say General Assembly? The General Assembly of the United Nations, what do you think is their, is their function? How does that relate to the church? Or the, even our National Assembly? Please go on, sir. Uh, the, the General Assembly is a place of convergence like using the UN General Assembly or the National Assembly as an example, is a place of convergence where different people come representing different nations and uh, topical issues or uh, issues of importance are discussed. They are deliberated on. Decisions are made. Even laws are passed that uh, affect or shape the lives of uh, people. And it cuts across all. There will be discussions on the economy, uh, peace. So, uh, the, you know, a, a lot of issues are discussed. And the people there are representatives of a larger number of people or nations. So uh, the assembly is very, very important or crucial. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to use assembly of something like a secondary school assembly, for example. Um, there it is compulsory for you to be at that assembly. And you, most of us that went to very strict secondary school, you know that if you are not in the assembly, it can be counted that you didn't come to school that day. Some people take it that serious. And uh, uh, I was in the PTF of my children's school recently, and they said, this school, the day starts from the assembly. Like we've had, the assembly is the place of information. And the assembly is not disorganized. There are officers. You understand? Even among the students, there are school prefects to put them, you, you are in order, you are in rank and file, everything. There are levels. Everybody stays where it is. There are teachers, there are, um, there are prefects, there are class reps. You understand? Everybody must, there is an order in the assembly, which is very important. Order in the assembly, there are authorities. We have the school prefect, the school teacher, and everything like that. So if an assembly is a place of order. It's a place where you get information. It's a place where um, laws are enforced. Some children will not come when, when you know you know you've offended. It's either you, it's either you are jittery or you disappear from the assembly. It depends on your level of naughtiness. So some people will not come. Do you understand? But the issue, what I'm trying to say is, if you've come to that general assembly, there are some things that needs to be there. You cannot wear a different uniform to a general assembly. They will point you out, you, who are you? Are you a student in this school? And if you're a student, what is this? Even if your dress is not good enough, there are issues. So assembly, the order, the uniformity, the authority, uh, they are very important. So when we come there, that's why, and that's what we should represent even here too, because that's the order, that's the, that's, that's the system we've come to in terms of General Assembly. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. So like you mentioned, we've all mentioned and um, beautifully explained you know, assemblies in different contexts, United Nations, school assembly, 
but everything you know, boils down to the meeting of people with a purpose. When assembly, the assembly here, looking at it in the Greek world, still means ecclesia. It means the meeting of people with a purpose. They are coming together for a reason. And like um, Dr. Adedoy said, there is order in the assembly. You know, there is um, authority in the, you know, in the assembly. There are, people don't just do anyhow. You know, like um, a songwriter once says, in God's presence, anything goes. Anything goes, but there's still order. You know, we don't just come and everywhere is just everywhere. Please go on, sir. One important thing, if your tribe is not represented at the assembly, you are not a member of the community of Israel. So that's why we also need to know, when you say the church is a general assembly, if your family is not represented, wahala deo, you know, at least. So it's true. So it's another reason to be part of this assembly. Because if they are going to bless the, the nation, God will say, a representative from each tribe, or some, some, in some cases, everybody comes together. At some point, say the elders. So, if there's nobody standing for your family, whatever blessing God wants to bring, it will not reach such people. So, this is one of the reasons also why the church, you know, we should teach people to put priority and attach importance to coming to church. Personal representation is one. Family representation is another. Then maybe you are standing for your organization or wherever, your group, your clan. So it's important. So this is another reason why the church as, a, as general assembly in the eyes of God is important. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. You know, we've all mentioned the importance of assembly, the convergence. I know people that say, you know, they can join virtual church and just send their offerings, send their tithes. But that's... You know, the, the scripture still emphasizes the importance of coming together. During COVID, we saw that it was important for us to have virtual churches and you know, um, also to bring in more people. But that, that coming together is still very, very key. Please go on, sir. I want to add that uh, in the General Assembly, we usually have uh, the leadership so that there will be orderliness. So there's, uh, in our National Assembly, you know, we have, you know, uh, the Senate President, you know, House of Assembly, we have clerk, we have different positions. And uh, looking at the General Assembly of God's children, where God himself is the head, and, you know, and we have angels and other believers uh, making decisions. Amen. Amen. Yes, there is order in a general assembly, and it's the same thing for a church. So there is orderliness. Can't just come and want to just want to see Pastor Fumi. Fine, we know that. I, we thank God for this community that you know everybody. But anybody can just walk up to the senior pastor. And so there are some communities that you must register, you must see PRO, you must you know because of the order in that church. So understand the order of the community where you find yourself and align. If you don't wear the uniform that everybody is wearing, you will be spotted out. Amen. That stood out for me. Let's pray. Let's just um, thank God for what we've heard this morning. And let's um, appreciate God and, you know, talk to God. What stood out to you this morning? In what way have we not been aligning to properly, you know, be um, aligning in the sense that um, understanding these names of God and also align to, to make sure that we are not the ones breaking the rules. Let's ask for mercy. And let's also pray that as the service continues, we encounter Christ, like we've said this morning, that this place is a place of heavenly Jerusalem. We should experience angels, we should encounter Christ, we should experience um, the, the, the same way there's joy in heaven, the same way that there's joy here in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Amen.